Hi Connor fans, Jason here, and today we are talking about our week in review. I'm going to move this real quick, get my microphone nice and close so I'm loud for you. Thank you for coming. Hi Jesse, we're back with the squad again, well said. Uh, welcome to Founder of the Day, this is our weekly recap where I'll discuss the last seven Founders of the Day. Um, just to update you guys, I think I did say this last week, I'm a little out of breath, I had to run downstairs because the computer gave me some trouble, so it took me till just the last minute to get ready, so I apologize. Okay, <laughs> just to update, uh, what I've been doing now is uh, I used to put out one new founder article every day on founderoftheday.com and then publish clips of this live video. Now I put out an article every day and a video about the same founder every day. So this is going to be a recap of videos I've already put out this week, but it gives you the opportunity to come ask any questions you might have had along the way. Uh, we can maybe further the discussion a little bit as opposed to these short clips. I'm trying to keep them under five minutes every morning uh, for you guys. So this will be a little bit more of a long form conversation. Again, I'm out of breath. I just ran around my house. Great, great way to start the video. So let's get out of the way and get over here and start talking about the impartial examiner. So uh, the impartial examiner is the... Uh, impartial examiner number five is the fifth, hi TJ, uh, the fifth of five impartial examiners. So this will be the last one that we discussed before moving on to our next anti-federalist paper that we'll be discussing for the next several Fridays. I'll let you in on who that is after we talk about this. We'll let some people show up. Um, but uh, for this one, number five, Essentially, this is a shorter paper. There's not a whole lot to discuss. It came out June 18, 1778, just as Virginia is about to start having its Constitutional Ratification Convention. And they discuss an impartial examiner. Again, this is an anonymous person in Virginia. Uh, what they're really essentially just saying is, is the problem really so bad? Are the Articles of Confederation really so bad that we need to entirely overhaul the government? Uh, the, the impartial examiner, like most anti-federalists, thought the answer was no. Uh, his, his attitude is that this is an overcorrection. That if an issue comes along in government, you fix the issue. If an issue really is so pervasive that it corrupts the entirety of a government, then yes, you might need a new government. That's why they had a revolutionary war in the first place. But if a problem is just affecting parts of the government and can be easily remedied, then it's probably better off just to remedy those parts than to overhaul the entire government. Now, the problem is the remedy for the Articles of Confederation is to have a unanimous vote of all 13 states to make those changes. And, well, they couldn't even get Rhode Island to go to the Constitutional Convention, so why would they ever expect Rhode Island to ratify any necessary changes? Uh, of course, that's not what the impartial examiner says. That's what all the Federalists were saying. Um, but again, really in this short paper, the, the impartial examiner is asking, is it really that big a deal? Again, to which the Federalists would say, yeah, it's a really big deal. Okay. Uh, there's not too much, uh, unless you had any questions, that is really not too much about the impartial examiner. Um, I will note, now I have to sneeze. This show is not starting off the way it's supposed to start off. Um, uh, it won't come out either. Um, next week, tomorrow, I should say, uh, we are starting our discussion on our next anti-federalist author, and that is Federal Farmer. Observations of a Federal Farmer is, along with Brutus, who we've discussed recently, arguably the most important and thorough uh, federalist, anti-federalist paper, especially when it's discussing the consolidation of the states and how that is going to be not great. <laughs> um, so anyway, uh, we are going to start there. Tomorrow's essay will be an overview of who the federal farmer may have been and a general discussion of what they're looking at. And then the following week, we'll start the first of then 18 weeks of 18 observations of a federal farmer. And they are worth going through all 18. I really do think so. So hopefully you stick with me. After that, I might go back and do the Federalist Papers again. So we'll, we'll, when that gets a little closer, because we're talking several months from now, uh, when we get a little closer to that, uh, we will talk about where we should go. So anyone popping in, thank you so much for coming. Uh, Jesse, I am doing great, bro. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go over and talk about our first founder today. 
Let's talk about John Glover. Now, again, like I said, I have made these videos, uh, but I, I just try and streamline them during the week. So we'll go into a little more depth this time if we can. John Glover is interesting. Uh, as it says next to me, he was the leader of the Amphibious Regiment as it came to be known. Uh, I believe it was Massachusetts um, 14th or 16th was the actual line. It was, it was part of the excuse me, Massachusetts line. What's fun about John Glover is he's a rags to riches story. He was born to a fairly poor family. Uh, his father was um, not wealthy and died young. And John Glover starts out, he finds his way to becoming a shoemaker. Uh, he ends up becoming then a fisherman and develops a really good sea power, I guess you could say. Uh, he eventually buys his own ship. He becomes a rum trader uh, and he becomes pretty wealthy. Uh, additionally, if uh, he was with uh, two other people, uh, Elbridge Gerry, who becomes very famous as an American founder, and Azor Orn, who is not as famous an American founder, though has a very interesting story of his own about... Uh, uh, sign, let's sign up for Azor Orn. That's why we're having the live video. So Azor Orn, uh, before the revolution, opened hospitals on an island to put smallpox patients on an I literal island off the coast of Massachusetts. Unfortunately, this leads to the Essex Hospital riots because the people of the town don't like that there are anyone with smallpox anywhere near the town, and they actually go out and burn down the hospital. Uh, and then they rebuild it and they burn it down. <laughs> and eventually, uh, people realize it it's a very interesting. People like, you know talk about disease today and some you know questions that people have back then people many people thought it was god punishing them and if you got smallpox you shouldn't have been sinful uh and furthermore having the hospital right there meant it could totally spread right here because they didn't know anything about how it might travel or anything of that nature so azo sorn and later really famous founder elbridge gary worked with john glover to set up the to run the committee of correspondence in their town in massachusetts Again, as a ship owner, he, uh, John Glover knew a lot about being on the sea and being in the ocean. And once the Continental, the first Continental Congress sends back the Continental Association and starts the boycott of British goods, John Glover ends up joining the committee, uh, be, being the inspector tasked with enforcing the boycott. So not only was he a ship owner who was super angry at a lot of the rules Britain were passing for the same reason many merchants were, well, he was the one responsible for telling other ship owners don't unload that tea, not right here. So once the war breaks out, Glover jumps on board and he is immediately a lieutenant colonel, but almost right away, his colonel dies and he is then promoted to colonel. And with this, he has a regiment, which usually consisted of about a thousand people under his command. Like him, most of his men were fishermen or seamen of some nature. And because of this, when it came to nautical discussions in the Continental Army, George Washington very quickly learned he could default to John Glover. And as the siege of Boston is going on, George Washington actually asked John Glover if he could use his ship, the Hannah, as a privateer. Now, privateers are essentially pirates, but they're giving a letter of mark by a government that says you can definitely be a pirate, but you're not a pirate because we said you can be a pirate. And uh, Glover takes one of these, but he takes it from George Washington, not the Continental Army, and it doesn't, most privateers kind of went out on their own into this, because privateers were a very good way to make money, because you got to keep most of the spoils of the ships you captured. You had to give the prisoners and the ships back, but you could keep most of what you found on board. John Glover doesn't do this. John Glover is essentially commandeered by the army, by George Washington himself, and it's because of this that the Hannah is often considered the first ship in the United States Navy. Now, about this time, John Adams and some other boys in Philadelphia were organizing the Continental Navy, and there were ships over there. Furthermore, Benedict Arnold actually builds a navy, literally builds a navy. American hero, Benedict Arnold, which I know people hate me saying, uh, it builds a navy on Lake Champlain, again, about this same time. So there are several ships that can be credited as the first ship of the United States Navy. Uh, John Glover is one of the people, his ship, the Hannah, which he named after his oldest daughter, Hannah Glover. Uh, and that uh, that navy, that vessel is used not specifically by Washington, but mostly to harass the British around Boston during the siege of Boston. Now, after Boston has been seized, 
Well, famously, the Redcoats go down to New York City. They, well, they go to Halifax, get a whole bunch more Redcoats, and then go down to New York City and take it pretty easily. And during this time, there's a very famous moment where George Washington has to quietly, by night, under cover of fog, sneak away from Long Island to Manhattan, right past the British ships. And who does he get to oversee this operation? Well, it's our buddy John Glover over here. Because John Glover had all these seamen under his command, and that's why they were unofficially known as the Amphibious Regiment, because they were good at crossing waters. You see, George Washington didn't load all his men on a ship and bounce over from Long Island to Manhattan. No, they had to sneak by the British ships. They used dozens of smaller ships, or I guess little boats, generally whaling boats, I'm under the impression, and they snuck by cover of fog past the British to Manhattan. And again, George Washington gets all the accolades for this, but the man who carried out the operation of loading a very much de defeated army after the Battle of Long Island on these boats and gets them across the water. Glover then sticks around through the treacherous 1776 campaign in New Jersey and uh, parts of New York, which does not go well for the Continental Army. But famously, George Washington leads his men across the Delaware River, the icy Delaware River on Christmas Day to go attack the British at Trenton. Uh, and at uh, Princeton and then Trenton. And who does he get to do this? Well, of course, John, George Washington gets all the accolades for this, but there were lots of boats and lots of men, and it was John Glover who organized his men. It was Glover's regiment that led separate boats, that piloted the boats across the river. And although he was far from able to get every person across, he was able to get enough people across that Washington could lead them against the Hessians in northern New Jersey. Again, uh, it's easy for us to give credit to the George Washingtons of the world, and that's why this channel exists, is for the John Glovers, who actually did the hard work of getting people on the boats and piloting the boats across these dangerous waters. Uh, that is really the core of Glover's service. He does serve, he serves for a few more years. Uh, he is passed over for a promotion to Brigadier General, and this is a common theme of the Revolutionary War when it comes to the officers. It's getting passed over really makes them mad when they're next in line in order. And Glover was next in line, and he did not get promoted to Brigadier General, uh, not right away. Uh, furthermore, his second wife, his first wife had passed away, his second wife was very sick, and his business had suffered for years because he wasn't there to take care of it. So he returns home, and Washington, uh, orchestrates his promotion to Brigadier General, finally. And when he is pr uh, promoted to Brigadier General, Washington writes him a letter and says, hey man, you got it. And Glover turns him down. He writes back because he's not satisfied with his qualifications, at least by his own words. I have a quote here from him. Uh, I could wish myself qualified, but when I consider my own inabilities and inexperience, I cannot think myself in any degree capable of doing the duty. Come on, man. You're better than that. You've already done a lot of work. Think positive, John, because George Washington writes back because George Washington is not a fan of getting turned down for things. And George Washington writes back to Glover and says, uh, well, I'll quote him. Our enemies count upon the resignation of every officer of rank at this time and a distrust of and desertion from the cause. And they rejoice accordingly. Uh, basically saying, yeah, John, they, the, you're doing the British a favor. If really important, uh, understanding organized officers like yourself who have experience leading this continental army are not going to accept promotions to general you are playing right into the enemy's hands and uh glover promptly returns and he would serve through almost the entirety of the war he'd serve through yorktown uh and then about a year after that when it, obviously the fighting has ceased he's finally like i'm i'm all done here see you later which at that point is you know fine <laughs> there was a lot of sitting around in newburgh new york for quite some time and glover didn't want any of that uh, it's, it's a really interesting character. He ends up playing a low role in local politics. I, I believe he served in the state assembly for a few years, but never really exceeds a, a, above that. He spends most of his time in, in local politics um, and building back up his mercantile business. Uh, so that's John Glover. If you guys have any questions, I'm here. I'm happy to answer them. That's what's fun about these. Anyone just popping in? We're just reviewing the articles and videos I already put out this week. This is just our weekly recap where you guys can ask questions. Uh, we can talk a little bit more casually get a little bit more off topic uh like i did with azor orn at the beginning because his name came to mind and i talked about him <laughs> over here we're going to talk about matthew tillman next the tillman family of maryland is really really fascinating 
Um, Maryland itself is a really interesting place. They were very afraid of Virginia taking over the whole of United States continent, the whole North American continent, and leaving a little bit of Maryland there. Uh, it's one of the reasons they took so long signing the, uh, the Articles of Confederation, because they were like, Virginia's got to give up everything it's captured in the Western theater of the war. By 1781, uh, George Rogers Clark had really captured a whole lot of central and what we now consider central and northern continental United States, and all of it was claimed by Virginia. <laughs> and Matthew Tillman thought that was a little much. Uh, I, I shouldn't say Matthew Tillman. Maryland at large thought that was a little much. But that's a little bit later. Matthew Tillman's role in the American founding is, is more important early on. But I, I will I do bring up the Tillman family because, first of all, like I said, Maryland was a little bit afraid of Virginia taking too much power. And also, Maryland had a large Catholic population, which was unique for the American colonies. Um, there were actually more pockets of Judaism around the colonies than there really were Catholics. Uh, Canada being accepted, of course. Now, the Tillman family, when things get a little get into upheaval, there is a disagreement within the family. You know, I often like to say the Civil War, we hear people talk about the American Civil War as, you know, a brother versus brother war, which in a way it absolutely was. That definitely happened. But it was also mostly North versus South. The American Revolution was a revolution. It came from within. And there were families. Father against son happened a lot more often in the American Revolutionary War than in the Civil War. You know, you see loyalists coming from every colony and patriots coming from every colony in large numbers. And the Tillman family is a really interesting example of this because Matthew sides with the patriots and his brother, whose first name is eluding me, sides, uh, becomes a loyalist. But his brother's son, his nephew, Tench Tillman, sides with Matthew, his uncle, over his own father and becomes a patriot. And Tench is an interesting story because he ends up being one of the young men who joined George Washington's family, as they like to be known. He was an aide-de-camp to General Washington for a long time, including at Yorktown. And Tench, Matthew's nephew, actually is the person who Washington sends on horseback from Yorktown to the Continental Congress to announce to Congress that the Revolutionary War had been won. So I'm putting this all in perspective uh, to talk about Tench Tillman. Again, these videos are you know a little more casual than, than the daily ones that I keep under five minutes. Uh, so Matthew is very interesting because by the time the, the First Continental Congress is called into order in 1774, Matthew had already been serving in the Maryland Assembly for over 20 years. And, and a significant portion of that time was spent as Speaker of the Assembly. Speaker of the House, for lack of a better term, for the Colonial Assembly. So he already had decades established as a leader in Maryland. And while we hear about this from revolutionaries in places uh, like, like Virginia, for example, you know, it's not, not every colony falls into that category necessarily. But Tillman, as a leader, steps up right away. And when when um, Virginia put out the call for a Continental Congress and, and Massachusetts, I wrote my article, Massachusetts, Virginia and Massachusetts kind of both put out the call for a Continental Congress. Uh, when the call goes out and it's decided to have a Continental Congress, several uh, royal governors dissolve the General Assembly. They're just saying, don't meet, you know, like a dictator. <laughs> and it didn't really help to dissolve the colonial assemblies. It radicalized a lot of people in a lot of ways because they could say, hey, look, they did exactly what they did in Massachusetts. We were afraid they'd do what they did in Massachusetts. So we called this assembly in Philadelphia and they did exactly what they did in Massachusetts. It's proving our point. Tillman was one of these people. So Maryland, what they do is right away, they call uh, a convention, the Annapolis Convention in uh, mid-1774. Now, don't confuse us with the Annapolis Convention of 1786, 12 years later, that would help lead to the Constitutional Convention. Uh, this was essentially the royal government. You know, New York called theirs a provincial assembly. Uh, some places called them, you know, uh, uh, the colonial assembly. Some people, some places took their, the original name from the government, you know, general assembly. So they call these meetings, these quasi-legal shadow government type meetings uh, by different names in each colony. And Maryland calls them a convention, just like they were about to have the Continental Congress was itself a convention or later would have the Philadelphia Convention. So sometimes they would use these terms a little bit interchangeably and, and they have a convention. It's only four days long in Maryland. And who do they put in charge? Matthew Tillman. 
And right off the gate, he is chairman of a convention in Maryland that is deciding what do we do now that the governor has dissolved the government. The first thing they did is they decided to send people to this meeting in Philadelphia, what we now call the First Continental Congress. Uh, they also elected him chairman. They came up with rules. They decided to send supplies to Massachusetts because Massachusetts port had been totally cut off and therefore Massachusetts had no way to receive food other than from within Massachusetts or from, you know, not by water. So from other colonies, carting it over with horses. Uh, and Annapolis, like many colonies, decided to do this in, a, in an effort to help Massachusetts. They also decided to support any boycott created by the First Continental Congress. And I find this really fascinating, too, because no one really knew how the First Continental Congress was going to turn out. But the fact that Maryland was going with going in with the idea that, hey, there's probably going to be a boycott shows kind of what they were thinking, you know, as they approached. Not everyone had this thought. In fact, many people were just hoping for straight reconciliation, for blind obedience, and straight reconciliation. That's why several delegates of the First Continental Congress become loyalists and are not permitted to return to the United States after the war is over. Tillman is leading a faction that is ready to boycott. They do not like what's going on. Uh, and the last thing they did is they chose delegates to attend the Continental Congress and head of the delegation to the first Continental Congress representing Maryland was Matthew Tillman, who was already essentially de facto governor of the state and the leader of pre-rebellion uh, Maryland. So, you know, he goes, <laughs> he goes over to Maryland. Uh, I'm sorry, he goes to the first Continental Congress. Things go fine. Comes back, he's sent to the second Continental Congress. Things don't go as well because the American, the war breaks out in Lexington, like, just as everyone's arriving in Philadelphia. They're, like, finding out on their way to Philadelphia. Lexington and Concord, one of their tasks was to arrest Hancock and Sam Adams, who were all literally just a few miles out of town on their way to the Second Continental Congress. So things are happening quickly. Uh, Tillman uh, does go, and he, he is there when George Washington is appointed as commander-in-chief, but he returns home to Maryland uh, instead of remaining in the Continental Congress um, to help prepare his colony. Now, he, at this point, he... Several members, the, the Annapolis Convention, still calling itself the Annapolis Convention, they put out a declaration of the Association of the Freemen of Maryland. And this document is essentially outlining the reasons that the people of Maryland should support the Continental Army and what's happening in the Continental Congress. Essentially, it's a declaration of war. Now, the war has already broken out in the Northeast, but... Not everyone in the South is necessarily ready to drop arms, travel hundreds of miles by foot, and start fighting a war against the king who was running the most powerful military in the greatest empire the world had ever seen. But Matthew Tillman, as head of Maryland, as the natural-born colonist who was head of Maryland, he, he was president of the organization, and therefore his signature was the first signature on the Declaration of Free Declaration of the Association of Free Men of Maryland. It's, it's essentially what the long title of the Annapolis Convention was. The, the Free Men of Maryland associated and sent out this declaration, and they said, we need to support Massachusetts. The war has broken out. You are essentially, you are with us or you are against us. And because it was Matthew Tillman, well, many people were with him. And they helped swell the numbers of the Continental Army in those early years where it was really difficult to help people join. Now, Tillman does return to the Continental Congress, and he is there for the debate on whether or not independence should be declared. Tillman supports independence and votes for it, as really everyone there did. <laughs> Unfortunately for Tillman and history, he did what many other people did when they voted for independence. They left. Because they said, okay, now we have 13 independent states, a.k.a. 13 separate countries here that all need to be founded. And like many other people, ran home as soon as independence was declared to help found the country that he was already essentially governor of. He was needed back home. So therefore, he's not around a month later 
when they sign the Declaration of Independence. Tillman's far from alone on this. Uh, Henry Wisner of New York, uh, uh, Robert Livingston of New York, who was on the committee that drafted the Declaration of Independence, though he doesn't seem to have done much. Uh, he runs back to New York to become chancellor for 20 years, which is essentially chief justice. Um, William Livingston, you know, his uh, uh, cousin, William Livingston, from New York, but of New Jersey, runs home to become the first governor of New Jersey, and he's governor of New Jersey for 20 years. Tillman doesn't really uh, take over. He doesn't really remain as governor once the he helps oversee the installation of a new constitution for the state. But once that happens, someone else uh, whose name is escaping me, who the first governor of Maryland is, leave it in the comments if you know who the first governor of Maryland was, uh, takes over. But uh, Tillman goes back to the assembly and primarily works in the assembly and the state senate for the next uh, decade or so for the remainder of his life. Because, um, again, one of the reasons he's so important at this point is he's really kind of old at this point. He's one of the older founders because, you know, he was already a leader. He had already been in government for 20 years. So that's how he made it there. So uh, that's a little bit of um, Matthew Tillman. If you guys have any questions, you wanted to know anything else, please let me know. I'm going to take a quick sip of my water because it's getting hot in here. As always, so that there's no noise in the background, I have to turn off the AC unit right before I start shooting. So I will be progressively redder <laughs> as the video goes on. But I do it for you, and for me, because it's fun. Peter Muhlenberg. Peter Muhlenberg is a lot of fun. Uh, there is, yes, I was just checking, there is a Muhlenberg College named after this man in Pennsylvania. Um, and he also has a brother whose name is escaping me, and that's why I'm bringing it up right now real quick. Uh... John Peter Gable Muhlenberg. What was his brother's name who served in the war? I will never know. I will never know. It's there somewhere. Muhlenberg family. Yeah. So, Peter Muhlenberg is part of a gigantic military, political, and religious family of Pennsylvania. They're kind of like the German founding family of the American Revolution. There were other German descendants, but they are a strongly German family family um right uh so let me see let me get back here so peter muhlenberg was born in pennsylvania and as a german speaker he was from a fairly wealthy family but while most european well most colonial families who had money sent their kids to england or scotland to get their education uh some people got educated in the col colleges in North America, but the good education was over in Europe. Most of American founders went over there. Muhlenberg actually went and studied in Germany. And he studied there and he returned as a pastor. He was, um, uh, I believe, a, I want to say Lutheran pastor. Man, it is escaping me. So his full name was John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg. I've noticed studying my own ancestry of this part of Pennsylvania that it seems that it was a German tradition to give everyone the same first name, and everyone seems to have gone by their second name. So his name was John Peter Gabriel Muhlenberg, but he went by Peter Muhlenberg, which is fascinating. And it's caused me trouble tracing my family back, because, you know, there's like John William, Johann Stephen. <laughs> Let's pick a first name. I don't know what the trouble is here. Anyway, Muhlenberg comes back to North America. And while he, he is from Pennsylvania, he goes to Virginia and he becomes a minister in Virginia and becomes good at it. And simultaneously, he ends up uh, a Lutheran minister. It's right here. Sorry, Lutheran. I should have remembered that. That's what my ancestors were in this part of North America. Although they may have been Mennonites, which is curious. Anyway, um, Peter, uh, Peter goes to Virginia. He starts a career as a minister and a politician. And he's elected to the Virginia House of Burgesses for several years, which was Virginia's name for its colonial assembly. Uh, while he's there, he becomes friendly with people like George Washington and Patrick Henry and Richard Henry Lee. And when his friends start being revolutionaries, well, Peter joins the club. He actually leaves the, his ministership and joins the Continental Army, and he becomes a colonel, and George Washington instructs him to raise a regiment. You know, just go get a thousand guys and come fight, and he does. 
He spent several years in the North uh, through the New York and New Jersey campaign fighting alongside Washington before he moved south. And he is actually put in charge by Washington to defend the state of Virginia. Now, technically, this was under the governor of Virginia's umbrella as the governor of each individual state was the commander in chief of the individual militias. Technically, uh, uh, whoever was governor at the time uh, for a while, uh, 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 Patrick Henry, for a while, Thomas Jefferson, they were technically in charge of protecting Virginia. Peter Muhlenberg is the Continental Army's representative there. Uh, so he was the one the Continental Army was answering to. And this is nice because that's Virginia happens to be where the Battle of Yorktown ends up. So Muhlenberg is there for Yorktown and he's there for the uh, victory. He actually participates under a brigade led by uh, the Marquis de Lafayette. So he is now an middle-aged man leading an army uh responding to a 20 year old kid <laughs> and that 20 year old kid is fairly famous if you're watching an american revolution channel you probably know the name marquis de lafayette now muhlenberg really gets interesting after the war ends he moved back to pennsylvania and is very quickly uh, elected as the vice president of pennsylvania's supreme executive council pennsylvania's first constitution lasted about 14 years and it was fascinating the first constitution has one unicameral legislature and there's not really an executive there's no governor the executive is a branch and it's a a board they call it the supreme executive council but it's a board of i believe five people and not a lot got done and a lot of people didn't like it and one of the reasons that the first pennsylvania constitution doesn't last all that long is they couldn't get anything done Although I will note, they did eliminate slavery under this crappy government. <laughs> um, uh, Muhlenberg, for his sake, is elected as vice president of the Supreme Executive Council, which, for lack of a better term, would make him lieutenant governor of Pennsylvania right after the war ends. Again, he's not really lieutenant governor. There's a board that can't make any decisions, but that's where he's at. So... A few years go by, and Muhlenberg is elected to a new position in this new federal government. He is chosen to the United States House of Representatives. He's an inaugural member of the United States House of Representatives, one of those first handful of people who got to serve in that tiny little government because there just wasn't that many states yet. <laughs> uh, he serves two terms. They're, they're not back-to-back, -back, though. He serves first term, loses a second vote, wins another one. Then he starts a Democratic Republican Society, and this is what Muhlenberg is probably most famous for. Now, we call it a Democratic Republican Society in hindsight, kind of like we call it the First Continental Congress, and they just kind of called it the Continental Congress. Muhlenberg starts this society. Uh, it supports the Jeffersonian side of things. At the time, they were basically considered anti-administration party because there was no party. There were no factions. George Washington didn't like factions. They, most of them didn't want faction, but it happened naturally, apparently. Uh, and even though he is a long-time old friend of George Washington, Washington gets really upset at Muhlenberg for starting this society. First of all, it's an anti-administration society, and Washington is the administration. It's the Washington administration, so you can see how he's a little peeved uh, with his buddy Muhlenberg. And, and in the video yesterday, uh, the, the interview with Dr. Uh, Chervinsky, we discussed how thin Washington's skin could be when it came to personal relationships with friends and how easily they could offend him. Muhlenberg really offended him. Uh, he was anti-Washington's administration. He was making communities and organizing gatherings to discuss what a terrible job George Washington was doing. On top of this, George Washington was famously adverse to the idea of faction. What we now call political parties, they called faction. And Washington thought America should be above this, uh, you know, Washington didn't run for a president. He stood for it. And it was up to the people to make those decisions. It wasn't about campaigning. It wasn't about politics. It was about the right person for the job. And these factions, according to Washington, and many others at the time, were not good for politics in general. Uh, therefore, this little club that his buddy started was not great. Uh, furthermore, because... It was associated with the Democratic Republicans, who many of whom were former anti-federalists. They get associated with the Whiskey Rebellion. And it doesn't help that Muhlenberg is living in Pennsylvania when he starts this society. And he becomes associated with the Whiskey Rebels in Washington's eyes. And in the eyes of many Federalist papers who wanted to make him look that way. Now, Muhlenberg 
very unlikely that he went to Western Pennsylvania at any point in his life, <laughs> but this is what he was accused of. Um, furthermore, he was his parties were accused of associating with Citizen Jeanette. Uh, Citizen Jeanette was the first French, not the first French minister to the United States, the first French minister after the Constitution was ratified uh, and during the French Revolution. And, well, the French Revolution was questionable to a lot of Americans, especially the Federalists. And uh, associating with Citizen Jeanette was not acceptable. So the fact that he was doing this, well, made people a little teary-eyed. And they didn't want anything to do with it. Uh, because of this, these democratic societies do kind of wane and falter. Uh, furthermore, many of the leaders like Muhlenberg and such go on to do other things with their lives. These really started out as kind of side note uh, uh, policies, uh, as opposed to, uh, or I should say side note clubs, as opposed to anything uh, really heavy and political. I, I do see you there, Jesse. I'm going to get to you in one second. But notably, the society that became the most ingrained was the one in New York City. You see a gentleman, an up-and-coming politician named Aaron Burr, whose name now strikes at your hardcores, but at the time, people did not hate this man. Uh, he was a young man who was coming up in New York politics. He was a first a Federalist because he was friendly with Hamilton and supported the Constitution, but after the Constitution was ratified, some of the Anti-Federalists end up on the Federalist side, and some of the Federalists end up on the Anti-Federalist side because that becomes the Anti-Administration, and then Jefferson, Jeffersonian Republican side. So... Aaron Burr is one of these people who crosses over to the Jeffersonian side at the same time he hears about the Mulligan Society, uh, the Mulligan, the Democratic Society's Muhlenberg had started uh, in Pennsylvania. He starts his own. He calls it the Tammany Society. And for those of you who study the rest of American history, Tammany Society, Lady developed, <coughs> excuse me, choking on myself, excuse me. The Tammany Society developed into Tammany Hall which would become known as kind of one of the most corrupt political machines by the mid-1800s. But when it was first started, it was just a nascent political machine. Interestingly enough, and we are diverting from uh, Muhlenberg a little bit here, but interestingly enough, uh, at the end of the 19th century, <coughs> leading into when Aaron Burr goes to become president, a young man named Martin Van Buren steps in to the Tammany Society in New York and is trained by William P. Van Ness, who is one of Aaron Burr's, uh, uh, I don't want to call him a henchman, but one of his subordinates, one of his lieutenants in the Tammany Society. And uh, William P. Van Ness has become famous because of the Broadway play Hamilton. He is Aaron Burr's second in the duel with Hamilton. But William P. Van Ness, when, when Burr becomes vice president, Van Ness essentially is one of the people taking over the Tammany Society, and therefore, a young man working under him, Martin Van Buren, learns how to do politics in a political machine from the Tammany Society. And 40 years, 30 years later, Martin Van Buren, while running Andrew Jackson's political campaign, runs essentially the first modern political campaign with not the same ads we have now, but advertising and songs and tours and parades and bombasticness. <laughs> and we can kind of directly trace uh, uh, Martin Van... I can't get his name out. He's not technically a founder, so I don't know his name. <laughs> we can technically trace Martin Van Buren's creation of the modern political system back to the Tammany Society in New York that was inspired by the democratic societies created by Peter Muhlenberg in Philadelphia. We got a little bit off track here. <laughs> but to wrap up Muhlenberg, he ends up going on to, uh, he, he is, they didn't used to vote for United States Senate. He used to be appointed by the states because the Senate is supposed to represent the state and not the people of the state. By the original meeting, that is. Not anymore, obviously. It's not how it works anymore. But that was the original intent. So he is appointed to a special session of Congress in 1801. Now, he's only there for two months, um, but he does serve briefly as a United States Senator. Uh, and then he has some interesting jobs at the end. He ends up being appointed, uh, he's recommended to be supervisor of revenue for the state of Pennsylvania. 
which Thomas Jefferson, now President Thomas Jefferson, appoints him for because his societies helped build Jeffersonian politics and really helped Thomas Jefferson get the political clout he needed to beat John Adams in a presidential election. Uh, he also, the following year, is given the additional responsibility by Jefferson as collector of customs for the port of Philadelphia. So he is the big, one of the biggest ports in the country at this time is Philadelphia in one of the biggest states. Uh, so he oversees Pennsylvania's, he's supervisor of revenue for the state and collector of customs for the port of Philadelphia. Essentially, he's the federal government's control of the finances into and out of the state of Pennsylvania, which again, at the time, Virginia was the biggest, most powerful state and New York was up and coming. But Pennsylvania was right there, easily number two three, if not number two, throughout this time period, and, and for many decades later. So, just to influence some of the weight given to Muhlenberg over here. I do have a question from Jesse. I'm going to sip some water while I look at it. Excuse me. I saw on a show where a family went to the original church, and they got to touch the Muhlenberg Bible stuff. Dude apparently had some fire sermons. Yeah, um... First of all, that's very cool. Uh, I, I did not know the Muhlenberg Bible was still around. I, I'm not surprised that the original church is still there. There's a lot of fun. If you guys live on the East Coast, anywhere up and down the East Coast, heck, even inland uh, towards the Mississippi, there is a lot of fun founder stuff. People have saved small groups of historical societies, have saved so many houses and preserved churches and buildings to keep this history alive. So I definitely suggest if you have anything near you like that, and, and you know, I'm... I live outside Syracuse, New York, so I'm on technically on the opposite side of the proclamation line of 8, 1763. I'm in Native American territory, <laughs> but, you know, I have right here down the street, I mean, Lafayette, I posted on Instagram yesterday, I took a picture of the Lafayette tour where Lafayette came through my town. So, like, it is there if you can find it. That's very cool that you touched his Bible. Um, uh, I don't. Uh, I do know, oh, I meant to bring up, so the Muhlenberg family was really important. He has a uh, brother, I believe it's his brother, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg. Yes, Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg uh, was also a uh, member of the Continental Congress and an inaugural member of the House of Representatives. So I forgot to mention this. Peter and his brother Frederick were brothers who both served in the first United States House of Representatives from Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania sent brothers there. And his brother Frederick was the first Speaker of the House of the United States. So, uh, yeah, it was a family affair. I believe there are other ones. Yeah, uh, okay, so I can't say this. Godif, should write about him. Godif was a pretty famous botanist. Um, uh, he has a great nephew that becomes governor of Pennsylvania. I, uh, Henry, another, another nephew, becomes a congressman during the uh, Adams administration, not Adams, uh, 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 Monroe, and, and so Peter and Frederick were important to the Continental Congress and the first United States Congress, and after that, you have uh, their sons and nephews end up becoming important during the Madison administration. They're like the newer, younger generation. They kind of come up with um, uh, Henry uh, uh, in Kentucky, Clay, Henry Clay, is the most famous of that generation uh and he is uh there you know so they actually kind of have a little bit of a dynasty a little pennsylvania dynasty uh which is a lot of fun we have another one aaron burr was a g yeah aaron burr was serious dude but if any fun founder stuff in georgia i don't have anything in georgia i don't own any property down there uh not yet but um uh, uh, there's, yeah, there's a lot, Georgia's got a great revolution. I mean, we'll get a little off topic for a second here, but, um, Georgia's fascinating because it was only founded about, you know, I'll bring myself up for a second, so it's not Peter Muhlenberg. Georgia was only founded in, I believe it was 1735, in the 1730s, so 40 years before the American Revolution. So, some of the people who actually founded the colony of Georgia are still alive when the American Revolution starts, and quite largely, their children are involved. First generation, jo children of Georgia's founders, there. Uh, additionally, because Georgia had only recently been founded, 
uh, a lot of people they were founded on some pretty strange ideas not strange ideals but uh poor thinking ideals uh were religious liberty georgia was actually a, not a slave state colony when it was founded it was very specifically founded without slaves and they got to a point later where they almost thought that it, it basically if they were going to survive as an independent from south carolina or florida or anything like that they needed to catch up financially and that was the way they saw it at the time I'm not defending it i'm just retelling you the information uh but in addition to being literally the children of the state the colony's founders there was only about probably 20 or 30 thousand people living there which is about as many people who was living in philadelphia at the time so just put some context on it they're all meeting in philadelphia for the continental congress and there's the same amount of people there as in georgia and at this point georgia was claiming as to the mississippi so alabama the state of mississippi all part of georgia at the time uh it just was sparsely settled it was it was harder to live down there as people who live down there might be able to tell you uh it was just above florida which was almost literally impossible to live in which is one of the reasons no one tried to really they did so georgia does try and invade florida but it's a kind of a half-assed effort and there is a lot of contradiction between who's actually in charge and furthermore the person who is essentially in charge of the army, uh, Lachlan McIntosh, really does not get along with Button Gwinnett, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, who ends up becoming governor of revolutionary Georgia. Though I have skipped ahead a little bit. Georgia, leading up to the revolution, people were leaving the northern colonies and starting to found Georgia. So there were pockets of like, there was like an area, uh, I think it's St. I want to say St. John's Parish. I don't remember what parish it was. They used the term parish instead of county, really. Um, and they had really serious... They had a lot of pockets of Yankees who had moved down there because, yeah, it sounds like Georgia's nice and it's an up-and-coming place. And if you were a young man who just got a law degree, it might be hard to break into the field of law or clergy or, or any of those jobs in Massachusetts or Connecticut or New York. But Georgia's up-and-coming. Let's move down there. So you find that Georgia is super heavily loyalist because there's not a lot of people and they need the protection of the British government from Native American tribes that are right there and the Spanish who are right there. Uh, and because of this, really only the pockets of people who were born and raised in the North end up supporting the American Revolution in the South. Uh, not the South, in Georgia very specifically. Additionally, some people were super radical because they really didn't like what was going on. Some people were not so radical. So even in the rebellious part of Georgia, there's a division, a really strong division. At one point, they technically have two separate revolutionary governments, which if you look at other revolutions around the world, is a really dangerous way to go about things. Um, in a way, Georgia is very lucky that the Continental Congress was there to help them sort things out. And the Continental Army was there for both governments to default to George Washington. It's another thing on the list of what puts George Washington above so many other human beings in the history of the world. Uh, 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 again, and I don't like great man history. I don't really like to look at one person in particular like that. But George Washington is a fascinating character in world history. Um, on top of that, cat's uh, uh, coming in, creaking the door uh, once, once an episode. Um, oh. Someone doesn't want to go to bed. Sorry about that. Um, furthermore, give me one second. Right. Sorry about that. The cat kicked open the door right when the baby was coming upstairs and he woke up and started fussing. So I had to ask my wonderful spouse to shut the door for us. Back to Georgia. <laughs> anyway, um, Georgia... Uh, so what Georgia does, they have these separate parishes uh, uh they have these enclaves of yankees who want to support the revolution now georgia does not send anyone to the first continental congress but they do have people someone shows up at the second continental congress uh uh, uh oh i want to say walton oh georgia oh boy this is gonna bug me uh uh walton i'm looking up the name because one of the three signers of the Declaration of Independence from Georgia goes to the Continental Congress. I believe it's not Walton. I can't. Oof, it's bugging me. It's bugging me, and I am going to look it up. While I do, uh, they select one person to go up there, and someone left. Sorry, sorry, I bored someone. <laughs> All right. What is the name? What is the name? Signing the Declaration of Independence. 
Uh, Georgia, Georgia, Georgia. Lyman Hall. I found it. Okay. Sorry about that. So, Lyman Hall is elected by his county as a delegate to the Continental Congress. Not by the state of Georgia or the colony of Georgia. Just his county sends him. And he shows up in Philadelphia saying, hey, I'm representing Georgia. <laughs> and they're like, no, man. <laughs> That's not how it works. Though, there was... It's not that this was unprecedented, because actually that's the way New York operated. Uh, um, Henry Wisner and John Herring were selected by the county, Orange County, New York, to go. Uh, uh, people were selected from New York, or Richmond County is what they called New York City. Uh, Suffolk County had sent people, so people were sent uh, by their county before, but at this point, Georgia was pretty heavily loyalist, and the colony had not, had, just, had actually said no to the Continental Congress. No, we're not saying anyone which is the same response they had gotten for both East and West Florida and the three Canada's. So the Continental Congress was a little bit, I don't know, what do we do here? And what they did is they finally said, you know what, if this county has chosen this person, that's how New York worked, that's how some other places worked, we're going to accept them. Uh, and Lyman Hall got to sit there. And then by the time the Declaration of Independence is called in, uh, Georgia finally weighs its support in and says, Button Gwinnett and George Walton also, who end up signing the Declaration of Independence. Button Gwinnett, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, and this has basically become a Georgia discussion now, <laughs> Button Gwinnett, signer of the Declaration of Independence, has the third most valuable signature in the world. I believe the top two are Caesar and Cleopatra, and then Button Gwinnett. And the reason for this is people want to collect a collection of all 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence, and the only way to do that is to get all 56 signatures. Now, it's actually kind of easy to get a signature for like Thomas Jefferson or George Washington or Abraham Lincoln because they wrote so many letters and signed every thousands of letters that still exist with their signature on it. You can get that. You know, it's a couple hundred bucks, but you can get it. Bun Gwinnett would be dead less than a year after signing the, con the, Art the Declaration of Independence. And we don't have that many copies of his signature. I think there's like 39. And that's it. That's all the, that's the total number of collections human beings can have. Uh, now he dies in a duel because he is part of the whole, he's governor of the invasion of Florida and there's a lot of back and forth. And as I said, Georgia becomes very divided along party lines between the revolutionaries. And he has a duel with Lyman Hall. Uh, 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 he has a duel with Lachlan McIntosh who kills him because Button Gwinnett was... One of those people who's not good at anything but politics, kind of like Sam Adams. Uh, Lyman Hall, uh, Lachlan McIntosh was a, uh, you know, brigadier general in the Continental Army, so he could shoot, and that's why Button Gwinnett is dead, um, uh, and because of that his signature is super expensive. So I'm going to get back to the founders, people popping in and out. I feel like we've done, I feel like that's a little bit of fun stuff for Georgia. That's a start. I mean, uh, we could talk, I could talk. Talk about William Henry Drayton, how South Carolina wanted to absorb Georgia into South Carolina for a while there. Uh, and William Henry Drayton was a, 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 a South Carolinian who went into Georgia and tried to convince the leaders of Georgia to join, <laughs> to join South Carolina and actually spoke in front of the Georgia Assembly and then was, uh, uh, the word is not deported, he was banned from entering Georgia by the governor, who I believe at the time was John Henry Trutlin, who later ends up being murdered in front of his family. For reasons we don't know, probably because of political reasons from within Georgia. Yeah, Georgia is a really fascinating place during the American Revolution. Really fascinating. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse, for your question. I hope you enjoyed it, or if I didn't put you to sleep. <laughs> um, so you will, let's get back over here. We've got three more founders to get through. Oh, and we're already approaching an hour. Okay, we're a little behind. That's all right. We're having fun here. Samuel Whitmore. This story is a lot of fun, but a lot shorter. So Samuel Whitmore, by the time he arrives in North America, he's already in his late 40s. He was a captain in the British Army. He goes, and yeah, I, can, I guess spoiler alert. <laughs> Samuel Whitmore goes to the... Uh, comes to North America as a colonel, in the, a captain in the British Army. He fights 
in the French and Indian War. He fights in not King Philip's War, um, Pontiac's War, uh, and um, and King George's War. So he fights in three different wars before the American Revolution. He seems to like it in America. He retires in America, uh, in Massachusetts, in Monotony, and he takes up a farm. And this is how he thinks he's going to spend the rest of his life. Because at this point, he's already in his 50s. He, he's done with his warring, one would hope. Uh, and through his fighting, he had uh, a French sword that he had stolen from someone and two pistols that he had uh, been awarded. And then the revolution breaks out. Now, he's a bit more in 1775 is over 70 years old. Or I'm sorry, approaching 70 years old. He sees British officers walk past his house in formation. He doesn't think much of it. This has happened before. Then he sees more British officers walk past his house. And he thinks, uh, what up with that? And he goes and meets with the rest of his community. And the local militia says, there's been some shots fired at Lexington. And there's been some shots fired at Concord. And they are coming back this way in retreat to Boston. So the militia takes up their arms. We're going to shoot at them when they're running by, right? I heard they burned Concord to the ground. Like, you know, that rumor had spread before anyone found out that that's not exactly how it played out. <laughs> they were just burning some things in the middle of the town. Uh, although a building did catch fire. Not getting into that. Either way, the British are coming back. <laughs> and uh, the militia hide up on a hillside, ready to fire from up high in the hill. And old man Whitmore hides behind a rock wall close to the road. And the rest of his buddies are like, dude, get up here. They're going to get you down there. <laughs> this is a really bad idea. And uh, Whitmore doesn't seem to care. And when the British come by, uh, the guys fire from the hillside, and some Brits are hit, and the Redcoats turn, and the ones who aren't hit, turn and start making their way up the hill because we're getting attacked. we got to go attack him. And all of a sudden, Samuel Whitmore does what I've, understood to be described as John Waning. You see, John Waning is when you are in the middle of a war, and instead of hiding behind your thing and shooting, and hiding behind your, your, your defenses and shooting, you stand up with people just shooting at you, and blast away, like you're in a movie, like John Wayne. And this is what Samuel Whitmore does. As the British are walking up the hill, he jumps out from behind his rock, shoots a guy in the face, blah, gone, dead. Uh, he drops his gun, you know, oh, it was this gun. Shoots him in the face, drops his gun, his musket, and pulls out his two pistols, and bow, bow. Shoots another guy in the face, and mortally wounds another guy. So three guys dead in, like, seconds. Now, Whitmore then draws out his sword, but all these other British officers who have been fired on now for over an hour and have been running away... Uh, they don't like this guy very much, so they uh, shoot him in the face. Blah! <laughs> and he goes down, and then they bayonet him. I don't know, 13 times? I do know. It was 13. I didn't make that number up. <laughs> um, and everyone assumes he's dead. And they keep firing, and eventually the British continue. They retreat away, and they're like, well, let's go collect our dead. And they go over thinking, well, Sammy's got to be dead. And no, they find him bleeding from everywhere stumbling around, trying to reload his musket. So they're like, no, they're gone, man. You're good. And they stand him up. They bring him to a doctor who's like, he's dead. This guy is not going to last longer. Uh, but he stitches him up anyway, sews him back together, sends him home to die in his house with the care of his loved ones, and he doesn't ever die. Eventually he does. I mean, this is 200 years ago. But he lives... Another 20 plus years to 98 years old. And for the last 20 plus years of his life, he went around bragging about the scars on his face because he got shot in the face <laughs> during the Revolutionary War. I told you it was short but sweet. That's a great story. And then that's the thing is Whitmore is actually kind of one of those characters. So his life is fairly well documented, but he's just a farmer. He was not anything. He was, you know, I believe he was a captain of the militia, but, you know, he was never really served in the war and the American founding. He just went back to his farm. He was already retired, basically.
All right, let's tear through these last three founders. So with these live ones, I'll be talking a little more casually and slowly. So we're going to, we're over an hour. That's all right. We'll do it. John Greenwood. I got a tweet about my article from George Washington yesterday. I think it's an imposter. <laughs> I don't think it's really George Washington on Twitter. There was no check mark. But uh, talking about Greenwood, what a great job he did. So John Greenwood, excuse me, John Green was living in Boston when the Revolutionary War was approaching. And he was just a teenager. And the one thing he really loved was the sound of the fifes that the Redcoats fifers would play. So he got his hands on one and learned to play it pretty well. He then joined the Continental Army, despite the strong protestations of his family being only 16 years old. Uh, he joins the Continental Army and spends three years fifing away. And fifing uh, sounds like a silly job to have in the Continental Army, but it's similar to what drummers did. Uh, when it came to calling people to order, um, marching formations, they helped signal people what was going on. And I'm sure playing some tunes around the campfire while they were uh, off duty, so to speak. Um, now, after the war ends, th that's really all he does. He serves there for a few years and leaves. He's a very young man this whole time. But he ends up, after the war, moving to New York City and joining the family business. Like his father, he becomes a dentist. Now, before we get to George Washington, what really made Greenwood notable in his day was the dental foot engine. So, dentists at this point had had drills for centuries, but instead of the dirt, dirt, dirt drills we have today, they were ones like you made in tech class in middle school, where you like have to turn the drill like this. And uh, it was not a lot of fun for the patient, and it was cumbersome and difficult for the dentist. John Greenwood invented a dental foot engine. What it was, was he took the foot pump from a sewing machine, because you would use the foot. You can't see my feet for my amazing demonstration as to how to use your foot, but you use your foot to bump the sewing machine to make it spin so you could, you know, on the spindle. He took one and attached it to a drill so that he could use his foot as an engine to do dentistry, the dental foot engine. This made it spin a lot faster. It gave the dentist the ability to really only use one hand. It kind of pulled down the victim, I mean patient, while they were doing their work. And uh, it probably hurt a lot because there was no Novocaine, but it was a better system, a quicker system, more efficient, uh, less shorter for the patient, therefore less painful, uh, and easier for the dentist to operate. And this made him a good amount of money. There were a good amount of dentists in the United States at that point. Uh, it was, as everything, a growing field with a growing population. He made a good amount of money on this. Now, he also did many things like make dentures, as dentists at the team did. And he, dentists at the team, dentists at the time did. And his of the many famous people he operated on, uh, his most famous client was George Washington. Uh, George Washington is famous for his terrible, terrible teeth. And John Greenwood was the man tasked with fixing this problem. Now, uh, first of all, George Washington started losing his teeth at a very young age. I don't remember the exact age, but I, I don't think it was much more than 30. Uh, when he becomes president, Washington is in his late 50s, and he's only got one tooth. Uh, it's, it's not because they didn't brush their teeth well. This wasn't happening to everyone at the time. Uh, Washington just happened to have some disease, we don't know what disease, I, I'll say, I don't know what disease is. There, I think there is some argument about what he actually had, but they've narrowed it down to a few gum diseases. Uh, and his teeth naturally fell out. Therefore, he had Greenwood make him these dentures. The dentures were painful. Uh, spoiler alert, they were not made of wood. The wood story, uh, as I talked about in the video the other day, uh, the wood story just developed over time, making Washington a larger-than-life figure. Uh, probably the teeth were very yellow, the fake teeth, which is why many people thought they were made of wood. Uh, they were made of ivory, uh, sometimes, I believe, lead, uh, and there was, uh, human teeth. <laughs> um, Washington had other people's teeth in his face. Uh, it's interesting, Greenwood actually put advertisements in the newspaper to buy teeth. Now... I did. I think I brought it up in the video. The, the accusation goes out that he used slave teeth. That is possible. It's almost. It's even probable. 
that that happened, though not at the large scale that you might think. Um, people, you know, this is a terrible way to look at things, but they considered slaves to be property. And you want to keep your property nice and efficient. And if a slave can't eat, then that property is going to lose its value. So the idea that, you know, slave owners, especially in New York City where he operated, you know, you might be able to make an argument for it in certain other states, but not in New York City at the time when they're like literally the New York Manumission Society is pushing through anti-slavery uh, laws. So the idea that you would like just take your slave and rip all their teeth out to sell them to John Greenwood doesn't really seem to have happened, uh, though I'm sure if a slave lost a tooth, the master would obviously sell it to Greenwood and things of that nature. Um, either way, not made of wood, made of grosser things like human teeth. Uh, although, hey, if you're replacing teeth, what better to replace them with than teeth? So Greenwood would wrap them in these big metal wires that were really painful at times for George Washington. And he... Uh, Washington, apparently there are some letters where Greenwood is writing to Washington because Washington would send them back for cleanings and repairs. Greenwood made several pairs of dentures that Washington would swap out when he saw, sent the other ones back to fix. There is an interesting note with Greenwood sending a pair back with like a kind of a scathing letter that you don't really usually see Washington receive, but it's from his doctor. And the letter essentially says, you're drinking too much port wine and not cleaning these enough. Not saying he's drinking too much wine, I'm paraphrasing, but it's the port wine you're drinking that is turning these these color. You need to polish them every day. <laughs> like, tisk tisk, man. Which is a lot of fun to see someone wag a finger at George Washington. Um, and then he actually retires fairly early. He makes a good amount of money making his dentures and, and, his, and his foot engine, his dental foot engine, makes him a good amount of money. So he retires to Connecticut, and Washington, who is president of the United States, uh, writes to him and says, I need you. And Greenwood says, I'm leaving, but I will make an exception for you, President Washington. I will still repair your dentures when you need it. Which, um, despite the fact that he had been tisking the president for not cleaning the teeth, he does see it as his patriotic duty to keep the president, uh, give the president the ability to eat foods. <laughs> so, that's the story of John Greenwood. Uh, we have gone over a little bit on this one, so... Uh, we'll, we'll run through Bill Ricketts. Bill Ricketts is a lot of fun. Talks a lot about the... Uh, it, it, Bill Ricketts brought the first circus to the United States. Now, the circus had actually started in England. And the circus is kind of as we know it today. It's definitely different what they were doing than what we would consider the circus today. But it's definitely the um, bread and butter of it. it starts in England uh, about a decade before the Revolutionary War. And Bill Ricketts, while the Revolutionary War is going on, is an Englishman who's learning about this. I know, an Englishman, that's a founder, imagine that. Uh, he is in England, uh, learns about the circus, the Revolutionary War ends, and Ricketts sees an opportunity. These former colonists need entertainment. And who better to entertain them than J.B. Ricketts over here? So he comes over to the United States uh, at the end of the 1780s, just as the Constitution is getting ratified, and he's ready to build a circus. Now, the circus has clowns and acrobatics and illusion and things of that nature that we would expect in a circus today and animals, but the primary attraction is horsemanship. And it's John Bill Ricketts himself. He's going to do stunts. Stunts, man. Uh, and his stunts are on horseback, and they're cool. We're going to talk about them. But when he arrives in, in America, the first thing Ricketts does is he goes and he finds the best horses to train to do his circus stunts. Uh, and he spends about a year recruiting and purchasing and training these horses and other acrobats to join him in his circus. When he's ready, he, he's in Philadelphia, where, by the way, the federal government has just moved. And he opens an arena, which is essentially a tent, like a circus, you would expect. Again, this is like the basis of what the circus became. So, Ricketts moves to Philadelphia, opens up his tent, uh, starts giving shows. And among the people who come to his shows is none other than President George Washington. Coming back a lot of Georgie today. Uh, George Washington comes to see one of his shows and is, seems to be very impressed with what he sees. Now, Washington famously was impressed by a horseback rider. And... I want to put this into context. Horses were the main form of transportation back then. So 
going to see a horseback a horse show is kind of like today if you went to see a car stunt show we all drive cars no big deal some of us are more impressed by cars than others some of us are more impressed by the driving of cars than others and Washington was one of the people who was very impressed with driving the cars of the day horses so John Bill Ricketts he's got his show ready Washington comes to see it everyone in Philadelphia society comes to see it because while we think of the circus as maybe not the most high class elite thing to do well Ricketts showed himself off as a gentleman so yes the rabble can come and watch my show of course I'm here to help everyone be entertained but I am a gentleman and therefore you President Washington you will be more than comfortable at my affair and all these people come and they see the show and it goes off great and now let's talk about his stunts so he does some fascinating things as you can see in the image next to me that's an old image of Bill Ricketts it's a little bit small but hopefully you can see it he would jump a horse over another horse he would ride around with standing on a horse with one foot and have one of his assistants standing on his shoulders on one foot so two one-footed people on the back of a horse moving at speed uh he would do uh the trick he'd be on horseback and someone would hold up a hoop and he'd jump off the horse through the hoop land back on the horse Ta-da! and then the one trick that i thought was the most fascinating and i don't know how he pulled it off probably just curled his toes or something or maybe hard boiled eggs but he would ride around with two horses, one foot on each horse, and under each foot he would have an egg. And he would not crack the eggs under his feet riding on horseback around the whole arena. It was fascinating. People loved it, including George Washington. So, uh, Bill Ricketts, he, he, he ends up taking his circus on tour. Again, he is the founder of the circus in the United States because he takes his tent and his big top and his circus on tour up and down the coast. Sadly, the tent ends up burning down, which, as I said in my video this week, if you want to go on a little bit of a morbid poll, uh, the history of circus tent fires in the United States is horrifying. So <laughs> I'm not going to get into it, but he sets the precedent of first major tent fire, although uh, I don't believe there are any injuries. I don't believe there are any injuries, though it might be tr not true, it might not have been documented very well. J.B. Ricketts might have been trying to cover some things up. Either way, that burns down. He says, okay, well, you know what? I'll take my act where I don't need a tent where it's usually nicer. Uh, I'll go to the West Indies. Now, unfortunately for him, this is just as the uh, quasi-war is breaking out. Now, John Adams becomes president during this time, and the quasi-war with France breaks out. And it's not a real, real war. There are some naval battles and some ships getting captured. And one of these ships is John Bill Ricketts' ship with all his horses and everything on it. And he says, no, 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 I'm just going to put on some shows, man. No big deal. And the French say, uh, no, no, no. <laughs> Sorry, French viewers. That is <laughs> that's uh, how I understand you say no in French. Usually I just say wee oui, wee, oui, but in this case, that doesn't apply. Um, John Bill Ricketts, uh, his ship gets captured, but he's able to convince the French that he's not sailing. They think he's carrying all these horses to give to Americans to fight against French people. And he says, no, I'm an entertainer. Watch this. And he does all these tricks. And because of that, he's able to convince the French that he is just an entertainer. Uh, and they say, fine, get out of here. They actually give him his horses and most of his belongings back. And he charters a ship to England to return to England and bring his now American show back to England and show him what I've become. And that doesn't happen because sadly, as happened at the time, his ship is lost at sea. And John Bill Ricketts, this whole life I just told you about, he dies at just 29 years old. Uh, disappears at sea. Sadly, so do all his horses. Uh, and that is the end of the man who created the first American-style circus. As I said at the beginning, not exactly the circus that we know today, but it did have clowns, it did have illusions and acrobatics. Um, and that's that. So we did run a little bit. We're about 15 minutes long today, and that's okay. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed it. You guys are asking questions. I really appreciate that. Um, any more questions? Help out me up here. Any more questions? I'm here to ask. Uh, uh, this is, uh, again, this is going to be recapping. I've changed what I've done now. I am putting out a video and an article every morning about the same person. So while these videos were just recapping the articles of the week, it's now also recapping the videos I've already put out. So while you're watching videos, if you see my daily quick under five minutes, I try and do five minute videos every morning of the week. And then eight o'clock at night on weekdays, I do different things, do the interviews like yesterday, which I hope you guys had the time to watch my interview with 
uh, uh, Dr. Chervinsky, we go in onto the Washington administration. She's coming back next week to talk about the second term of George Washington's administration, which I'm super excited for. So I honestly think it's one of the top three videos I've ever made. So really, I really recommend if you want to learn about George Washington's administration, definitely check that out. She does most of the talking and it is fascinating. Um, uh, on top of that, so th this video is basically going to be a recap of the videos I already put out. So while you're watching the videos over the week, if you have a question, if you have any, you know, those videos are only three to five minutes long, just at the essence of a founder's life and what makes them interesting. I can use this opportunity on Thursdays to recap and expand in any fashion you like. So come with questions. That would be amazing. I would love to help out in any way I can. So thank you, TJ. Uh, thank you, Jesse. Thank you, anyone else who has come along and watched along the way. Uh, tomorrow we are playing trivia as we do every Friday. Uh, so if you're interested, come for that. If not, definitely like, and subscribe. If you're new here, uh, like I said, I put out videos, a video every single morning of the week about a different founder, except Fridays. Don't be surprised tomorrow when it's about, uh, an anti-federalist because we did the federalist for a year and a half every Friday, and now we're doing the anti-federalist papers. So, uh, please check that out. I don't know if I revealed it. We are going to be starting. <laughs> I can't do drums. Uh, the federal farmer tomorrow. So we're going to, tomorrow's going to be a brief overview. And then for the next 18 weeks after that, every Friday, we will be discussing uh, each individual paper. And I know that's a lot, but I, I'm going to put it in my quote tomorrow. But uh, uh, this uh, Herbert Storing is one of the authorities of the Anti-Federalist Papers. Uh, and he specifically says in this, it, it comforted me because I was thinking, oh, man, I'm going to do 18 papers again. Um, and he says it is worth reading all of them because the federal farmer is arguably right with the essays of Brutus. The observations of federal farmer are the two really major anti-federalist papers that have a lot of influence, not just in the people who were voting in the constitution at the time and not just as modern day criticism of the constitution, we should be aware of, but in a large fashion led directly to the bill of rights. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Come along for the ride. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, and we ended these videos with um, the name of a property that General George Washington once owned in the Ohio region and sold off, which I thought was funny a year and a half ago. And some of you guys wanted me to keep saying it. Uh, so it is called Round Bottom. Now you know why we thought it was funny. <laughs> uh, as with George Washington in a property he sold but never actually lived in. I will see you guys next week and Round Bottom.